It is probably the day on which we have more historical detail, both inside and outside of Scripture, than any other day in history. Which amazes me because there are so many attacks recently on the Christian faith and they center on, oh, computer blogs come along and they say that Jesus, even as a man, never lived and this kind of thing. Oh, what stupidity. I mean, anyone who makes these claims is just flaunting his ignorance. We have so much detail uh, outside the Bible as well on what took place on that day of days. Uh, for instance, I love to use the works of the historian, a Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus, mm -hmm. who gives us additional detail on Pontius Pilate, for example. Now you wrote a book on Pontius Pilate back in the 60s, which yes, indeed. is still available in, in bookstores and on Amazon.com. It's called what, Pontius, Pontius Pilate? Pontius Pilate, simply, yes. Uh, I, now, when, when you researched that story as a historian and then wrote it, I mean, what, what, did, what did you learn and what do we need to know just in a kind of a brief uh, overview of, of him and his role in all of this? Well, the reason I engaged in, dare we call it the pilot project? No, I don't think we have to. In any case, uh, here was a living, breathing human being who was the physical link between the secular evidence and the sacred evidence. This has always been my hobby over the last 30, 40 years of my historical research, to see where the points of tangency might exist between the scriptural record and the secular record. Hmm. And there are all kinds of points of tangency, all kinds of bridges that can be built between the two sets of evidence. And here's a physical personality, Rome's man as governor in Judea for 10 years from 26 to 36 AD. And we can now get additional information on him from Roman sources that mention him. Cornelius Tacitus, for example, mentions the name Pontius Pilate. We can get uh, even physical uh, evidence on Pilate because they found a, a cornerstone of a building which he erected in Caesarea. I've which seen was it. The, you have? Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. Well, to I, the people of Caesarea, Pontius yeah. Pilate, the prefect of Judea, has presented the Tiberiaeum in honor of the Emperor Tiberius. You know, I think I think the one that's there in Tiberius is obviously a replica. I think the the original is in the um, Israel Museum Israel in Jerusalem. Museum in Absolutely. Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, you know, when I lived in Israel for seven years, as you know, and I many many times went to Caesarea, and I would always point this out to my friends. You got to see this. Uh, well, why was that uh, find so important? Well, because there were scholars. Pseudo scholars, in any case, in the last century, for, I still refer to the 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bruno Bauer, for example, was one of the skeptics who said uh, there never was a uh, historical Jesus or anybody he intersected with. Pontius Pilate never lived. Well, to any, and those claims are still made today. These are people who simply don't have the facts. Uh, here you have hard evidence, archaeologically, you have the smoking gun from the ancient world that there was a Pontius Pilate. His name's on stone. Yeah. Now, Pontius Pilate was uh, conflicted, wasn't he, uh, when Jesus was brought to him uh, to be tried. Um, was this evidence of him be being a good man, or was he just a good jurist, or he realized that you know this this is a this is a lynch mob? Uh, what do you suppose the conflict was all about? Well. This is exactly the intriguing questions I was asking myself because yeah. I found a, a big disconnect between the New Testament version of Pontius Pilate where you have this governor trying every legal trick at his disposal to unload this case mm. and our Good Friday preaching where Pilate is regularly yeah. condemned yeah. from the pulpit, yeah. pulpit as a, a person just a little half cut above Judas Iscariot in the mm. bowels of hell. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, will the real Pontius Pilate really stand up? No, he does have a story. He was, in fact, the Roman governor trying to do the right thing. But he was kind of behind the eight ball in terms of his relationships with the Jewish people. Uh, there had been two or three incidents before the Good Friday episode in which he innocently fouled up. Uh, once he tried to uh, introduce Roman military standards that overlooked the temple, and that was against the second commandment. There's yeah. a big riot. Another time he's trying to do nothing more than improve Jerusalem's water supply. He builds an aqueduct, and for a while he's praised until the word gets out that part of the temple treasury subsidized that operation. And then there was another riot and so forth. And so uh, the third time um, he did nothing more than hang up a couple of golden shields in his office in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, which was the Palace of Herod, the west part of the city. And these were not offensive, no images on them. He had his fingers burned on that one. But this had only kind of a, a slogan at the edge, a dedicated to Tiberius Caesar given by Pontius Pilate, the equivalent of having a provincial or a state flag in addition to the national flag of America or Canada in the office. 
And this also caused mm -hmm. a, a, a demonstration by the four brothers of Herod the Great, uh, the sons of four, sons of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas mm -hmm. and his three brothers. Uh, he's the one who killed John the Baptist, you recall. Yeah. And he tattled to Rome and Pilate got a warning letter from Emperor Tiberius to soften up and don't involve the Jews in any further uh, troubles or he would have outlived his usefulness as governor. So maybe there was a bit of uh, uh, self-protection in his uh, conflict. Yeah. Uh, toward yeah. the end, it's either Jesus or himself, yeah. really, when it comes down to it. He Do loses we, a job. Did, did he lose a job after the, the Jesus incident? He was recalled three years after the Good Friday episode. Mm. We know that for sure. Again, mm. Good Friday took place on the 3rd of April, 33 AD, and he was recalled three years later in 36. And what caused his recall, of all things, was a, a riot on the main north-south highway in Samaria. Mm. Uh, the Samaritans, of all people, got in the act. They had a religious rally on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of right. Blessing, mentioned in the Old Testament. And all Pilate did was a police action trying to put this down. But they tattled to the Roman Senate and the Roman Emperor, and Tiberius sent him his walking papers. Now we're going to have Pilate return to Rome, and this time be on the other side of the judicial bench. And what do you know, Josephus tells us, before he got to Rome, Tiberius had already died. Yeah. So he didn't face the music there. Ha! Huh. <clears throat> I'll never forget my only time among Gerizim. I was there for the celebration of the Samaritan Passover. You, were you really? I was. Well, yeah, well, they still celebrate by killing a lamb. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's an amazing thing to watch. Every family has a lamb. Yeah. And yeah. They, they weave uh, um, roses into the wool. And, is that right? And, and the old high priest comes out and stands on a rock and he leads in a prayer just as the sun is setting. It's the most amazing experience. Anyway, that's, this is about you, not about my experience. Well, you certainly know what I'm talking about. I that. certainly oh, yeah, know what you're talking there. about. <laughs> now, let, let's talk about the events of Good Friday itself. Uh, why do you suppose Pilate had, you know, with all of his conflict, had Jesus flogged? I mean, more than flogged, I mean, his, his back was laid bare. Why, why, why that? And why the crown of thorns? And why the king of the Jews sign and, and all that? Was, was he playing to the crowd? What, what was he doing? Believe it or not, Jim, this was part of his defensive strategy in behalf of Jesus. He thought that by flogging him, making him an object of uh, sympathy, maybe, because yeah. of all this torture. You know, it's at least better to be flogged and stay alive right. than be killed. Yeah. He still wants to save Jesus' life. Mm. Now, again, you know, we have a perfect parallel to what happened on Good Friday, which I try to bring out any time some scoffer comes along and says this isn't historical. 29 years after that event, we have a perfect parallel to Good Friday that everybody has overlooked. In the year 62 AD, Josephus tells us that Jesus' half-brother, James the Just of Jerusalem, was stoned to death by the Sanhedrin in the absence of the Roman governor who hadn't gotten her yet. His name was Albinus. And when he arrived, he was so ticked off that this kangaroo court action had taken place that he had the high priest canned out of office. <laughs> the second time a Roman governor is trying to do the right thing. Look at the parallels. We have Jesus on trial for his Christianity, and we have his half-brother on trial for his Christianity uh, 29 years later. Governor here is Pontius Pilate, trying to defend Jesus. Governor here is Albinus. He didn't get there in time, but he's trying to do the right thing. High priest here is Joseph Caiaphas. High priest here is his brother-in-law, Ananus. Sanhedrin here, Sanhedrin there. Mm. So maybe some of the same members. Mm. I mean, this is a perfect parallel to what happened. And, and so I get just absolutely furious at these people who come along and say this wasn't historical. Mm -hmm. By the way, Joseph Caiaphas, I guess you know the good news about that, don't mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Here we have the high priest of the Jews whose bones have been discovered yeah. in Jerusalem. The, in fact, these are the bones of the first biblical personality ever to come to, uh, be discovered thus far. I was there the day they discovered them. I, really? I was there. I was uh, shooting something for Crossroads, and I was taking a break, and uh, I saw these, these archaeologists working down in the valley. And, you know, when I lived in Jerusalem, I would always go to these digs to see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And I go down and ask these guys, what's, what's up with this? What are you doing? 
well, we've just, we think we found the, the tomb of, of Caiaphas. I said, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. Because I, yeah, I, I understood that yeah. there, there were, again, uh, historical revisionists who had said that Caiaphas had never really existed or lived. And so I, I stumbled on this thing the very day that they, uh, that they discovered it. And I, I, <laughs> I thought, you know, I mean, how, how blessed am I to be here at this moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just seems too, too, too good to be true. Yeah, no, yeah, it, yeah. it really does seem to be yeah. too, good, too good to be true. But the fact is that the, 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 the historicity of the scripture just keeps uh, proving itself again and again. Well, hard evidence. I mean, yeah. this isn't somebody's theory. This is the smoking gun from the ancient world. What, do you, what, uh, what about this, uh, this cross business? Now, I, th there had been, what, maybe thousands of zealots crucified in, in, in the period up to the crucifixion of Jesus. This was not an unusual event, right? No, not unusual indeed. And of course, the critics used to howl at that one, that the Jesus couldn't have been nailed to the cross, you know, yeah. the old. In fact, uh, remember the late uh, Bishop Pike? Yeah. Uh, who. Uh, said some good things and many bad things, as you well know. And he well, died in the wilderness there exactly. in, in Israel. His last theological treatise, Unfinished, was to try to disprove the Gospel of John that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Human flesh is too fragile to hold a nail. Supposedly they tried it in somebody, it didn't work. I don't know who would lend himself to that great enterprise. But in any case, uh, Christians used to try to defend that by saying, well, the spike went into the wrist or in something wrist, like that. Yeah. It can go to the palm now because they discovered the bones of the first crucified victim ever to come to light in Givat HaMivtar, the northeastern uh, suburb of Jerusalem, where a, a bulldozer slices open a great burial cavern, there are 36 ossuaries, bone chests, and one of these belonged to Yochanan ben Hagakol, his name was. They lifted it off the lid, and there we found seven-inch spike, still lodged in his heel bones, proving, yes, they did crucify people that way. Uh, holes in his wrists, both legs broken. I mean, is that a perfect confirmation yeah. of what happened to Jesus on Good Friday? There's an old hymn, there is uh, a green hill far away, and the, the view from a lot of artist depictions has been three crosses up on this hill. Uh, it's my understanding that he was probably crucified at the bottom of the hill where they used to stone people. You've been there to Israel, right? Indeed. Yeah. Uh, do you think that was the case, that, they, that he was probably crucified at the bottom of the hill there, at the bottom of Skull Hill, or how do you, how do you see it? I think there's a possibility that that could be right. By the way, you know, also Jesus addresses, we always have the top of the hill and so forth. Yeah. I think Jesus was down in the arena area and the people were sitting on kind of a, a, a parabolic curve in uh, the background. That's how they could hear him, you see. Uh, uh, in the case of, of Golgotha, I'm not quite sure, only because crucifixion was a very public yeah. way to uh, prevent further crime that this miscreant did. In other words, you're supposed to be able to see him, pass by, see the sign, and say, don't do what this person did or you're gonna get hung up like he is. Mm -hmm. See, and for that reason, top might be a little bit better. But we, but I think it's, uh, there's equal proof that it could be the bottom. Yeah. But it was on the road from uh, Joppa to uh, the Mediterranean yeah. coast, definitely. Yeah. Just outside the city wall. Uh, do you get involved at all in the, uh, sometimes it's an argument, sometimes it's just a gentle discussion as to the site of, uh, of Jesus' tomb? Uh, you, we've got the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and then you have the, the garden tomb. You've been to both places. Uh, how do you see it? I usually tell people when I take a tour there, I lead a tour there, uh, what you will prefer, of course, is the garden, too. Of course. It's a lovely place to meditate, yeah, yeah. and you've got Golgotha conveniently right. next door, right, and so on. Uh, but I tell them it's simply not historical, yeah. uh, that we just don't have anything linking it archaeologically or historically. Yeah. And the place where it probably did happen was the Church of the Holy yeah. Sepulchre in Jerusalem. I warn them ahead of time. Close your eyes when you're at the, at the yeah. resurrection tomb there. You're not going to like what you see, but in terms of longitude and latitude on earth, this is probably where it happened. Well, how come we don't have that preserved today, the Green Hill far away? Well, I wish we had that today, but through the years, you know what happened. Yet Constantine's engineers and architects come along and try to figure out where this was because Constantine wanted to erect a church there. And so they took Joseph's tomb and cleared it out from yeah. the escarpment where yeah. it was located. Now it's isolated. They built a rotunda over it. Yeah. Then later on, a separate church over uh, the place where Jesus was crucified, then the resurrection tomb, then they connected it in one church. Look, Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt yeah. 13 times. What was Toronto like 200 years ago? Yeah. 
didn't exist. Well, it did, yeah, okay. Well, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Cities grow. Yeah. And you can't expect Jerusalem to stunt itself and not grow. Yeah. So today, of course, it's right in the center of the old city of Jerusalem. But in those days, it was outside the city wall. It was outside wall. the city wall. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I had some Jewish archaeolog archaeological friends tell me exactly what you said, that with this sacred site, they carved out the area around it and, and enabled, exactly. enabled people to come and, and, and gather yep. around it. And, yep. But uh, the point is that where, wherever the tomb is, uh, it's empty. Now we're talking Good, uh, good Friday here, but you know, as Tony Campolo says, Sunday's coming. Um, what, what about the, um, the, 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 the dying on, on Good Friday? There were a number of uh, cataclysmic events that accompanied the, the, the death of Jesus. Uh, as an historian, how do you see this? I know. Matthew, of course, loves to report star and, and, and great activities that take place. And so the critics just love to jump yeah. in on that one. Yeah. You know, Matthew always uh, emphasizes the supernatural and so on. Well, now, wait a minute. Do we have any outside evidence? Well, interestingly enough, it's almost hard to believe. We do have reference to the, both the earthquake and the darkness in material outside of Scripture. Uh, there was a historian of wonders very much like Ripley. Now, believe it or not, by Ripley, the, the old uh, strip mm -hmm. and so forth, most of what Ripley said, and maybe all of it, was really true, believe it or not. You know, I mean, it wasn't just sensationalism. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, here's an ancient version of Believe It or Not by Ripley. His name was Phlegon, P-H-L-E-G-O-N, Phlegon, mm -hmm. a writer of uh, Greek wonders. And he said that in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, there was a darkness uh, all over his horizon and even an earthquake, and he was writing at Nicaea, by the way, talking about Nicaea, which is where the great creed, of course, was formulated mm. later on in 325. Now, I then went back to my favorite date for Good Friday on the basis of pretty hard evidence, the 3rd of April uh, in, in uh, 33 AD. It turns out that the fourth month of the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad is April of 33 AD. Wow. So and this, that's not how I arrived at the date. I had the date first. Yeah. But then I played this evidence into it also. And it turns out that this thing evidently was more broad than we might have thought. Hmm. Yeah. And then uh, this veil that was rent in two when Jesus gave up the ghost, as the King James Version puts it. What was that all about? Well, there is a rabbinical tradition that involves a, uh, a scholar who was very concerned about the way things were going in Judaism. And he wept for the fall of Jerusalem even 40 years ahead of time. And uh, indeed, the veil itself was, of course, to shield the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. Very thick, I understand. Yes, very thick indeed. Yeah. And uh, the earthquake itself uh, would have torn this at the time. There's no question about that. And there's a reference to that earthquake, believe it or not, in the Jewish rabbinical traditions. So, uh, uh, Jim, uh, every time you get evidence, you know, you find hardly any evidence that controverts the biblical evidence. It may seem to at first until all the archaeology takes place. But time and again, you have these confirmations. I've got about three minutes left. Tell me about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and the role they played with Jesus' body after he had died. Members of the Sanhedrin, both of them are, yeah. the official council of 70 of the Jews. Yeah. Uh, we know that they certainly did not concur in the decision that Jesus should be terminated as the rest of their colleagues did. Uh, however, many were not quite sure, but it does seem that all present, uh, sometimes they say all present, uh, condemned him, but we don't know if that certainly didn't include Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus had come across both of them, of course, in his early ministry. Uh, one of the interesting scenes in the Bible is Jesus' nocturnal visit with Nicodemus, as you, you well recall, uh, who was really uh, one of the intellectuals kind of testing Jesus out in his claims. And so he had never any reason to turn against Jesus. And indeed, Joseph had this wonderful new rock-hewn tomb in which he had hoped to be buried in Jerusalem, the holy city, great place to be buried. Hadn't been used yet, and evidently they were colleagues, probably in the faith as well, but secretly for fear of the Jews, as the expression goes. And indeed, you know, it took some courage at first at the inception of Christianity to believe this. Later on, of course, we have little trouble believing in the world's most successful phenomenon, strategically considered, 
numerically considered two billion, two hundred fifty million, and nothing like it, you know, in any other religious system. Now it's great today, but in those days, just getting started took a lot of faith. So therefore, there are crypto Christians, you might say. And they then wanted to see that Jesus' body was properly taken care of. At first, I think probably their hopes must have been pierced that this Messiah would ever rise again, but that's the glory of Easter. Yeah, and uh, the, the preparation of the body was quite a, quite a, a routine, wasn't it? I mean, wrapping... Yeah, it wasn't even complete. That's why the yeah. women came yeah. out on Sunday morning. Yeah. I understand they would put layers and layers of cloth mm -hmm. and then and spices between the layers, and it would be almost like a, uh, like a body cast. Something like it, yeah, indeed. Uh, by the way, you know, we can prove historically that the tomb was empty. How can, I mean, we, how can we prove it? Well, this is the last two chapters in my book, In the Fullness of Time. I really tr trotted out the whole argumentation. And uh, the two basic arguments are one that you've always heard of. And that is, hey, how could Christianity ever have gotten started if there were a dead body on the hands? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one argument that's never been countered. That alone proves it as far as I'm concerned. But what I did was to adduce evidence from the outside. Mm. Jewish rabbinical traditions also admit the tomb was empty. They never say the tomb was empty. They say the body was stolen. Right. Well, say the body was stolen, empty tomb, same thing. So we can really prove historically. I can't categorically prove the resurrection for you, okay? And I think that's how God wanted it. Mm. Else where would faith be if you didn't have yeah. total proof? But the empty tomb, we can prove.